What's up, guys? So when somebody says the first person you think of anytime you hear the word firearm, for me, well, being a Utah boy growing up loving guns, Browning. I mean, he's the gun father. His, his specifications, everything he came up with, still used to this very day, all of his guidelines. I mean, he goes from a humble guy in Morgan, Utah, that's just one of the well, biggest well-known names in the firearm world. I mean, every firearm uses some of Browning's designs. I mean, whether it be your 1911 frames, I mean, how many, how many pistols have came out just based off of his design? And I know most, most guys like the 45 1911. I love the, the firearm as well, but this one is the one that stole my heart in the firearm world. So without wasting any more time, let's get to it. Real quick here before we get going, we do not use live ammunition unless we are at the range in a safe controlled area. We do recommend all safety precautions and training. Browning's parents were from a Mormon pioneer handcart company that ventured to Salt Lake City. He was born in Ogden, Utah, which is north from there. At the age of 13, Browning had already crafted his first firearm. In 1879, Browning had received his first patent for his single-shot, breech-loaded shotgun, which he sold to Winchester, which changed the firearm industry forever. At the turn of the 20th century, the United States military was looking for a more effective caliber than the 38 Long Colt, which was used in the Colt 1889 double-action revolver. Um, the, the cartridge was considered anemic and generally not very effective against uh, Moro tribesmen in the Philippines during the revolt. The U.S. military wanted a magazine-loaded, semi-automatic pistol of at least a 45 caliber. So there, there were numerous 45 caliber pistols, semi-automatic pistols, tested from numerous makers all over the world. However, the 1911 having better safeties, easier to take down, more ergonomic grip. Close quarter, man-to-man -man combat fight. It had great stopping power because it was chambered in God's caliber, 45 ACP. Uh, so it's timeless design, you know, it was the masterpiece at the time. Browning felt that it wasn't complete and it wasn't good enough. During development of the Browning A5 or Automatic 5 shotgun, Browning was in a big, big old argument with T.G. Bennett over having being paid royalties. Bennett was the then vice president of Winchester. Browning was so upset after three years of negotiations, he grabbed his prototypes and he headed on over to Remington. It was January 8th, and Browning was to meet Marcellus Hartley, who was the president of Remington at the time. However, before the negotiations could take place, Hartley had actually died from a heart attack. Browning ventured over to the National Factory in Herstal, or FN, to meet with their then president of the company. The negotiations he had with their president, Henry Frenet, lasted four to six weeks, and by March 24th of 1902, the Browning had granted FN the exclusive world rights to make and sell his A5 shotgun. It was the 1920s when the United States would have to end up going through prohibition due to the Volstead Act. On the other hand, across the Atlantic Ocean, in Europe, the Great War, or World War I, was taking place, which is barely ending in 1921. Browning had decided he's going to develop a new firearm, a new pistol, that would actually correct all the issues and mistakes the 1911 had, as well as do it in 9, 9mm chambered round which still had decent knockdown power, however they were able to hold more rounds in the magazine. Unfortunately, Browning died in 1926 before he would ever see this masterpiece of his completed. There was so much respect for him, however, that FN still call it the Browning High Power. FN completed the development of the High Power in 1935. The high power has been considered one of the classics. It's been used in multiple militaries and law enforcement agencies worldwide. Anyways, guys, 
Thanks so much for watching. Guys, you have a great rest of your day.